and welcome to The Franchise Life. I am your host, Stacey Shannon. Today, I have two fantastic guests with me, Alan Young, who is the founder and CEO of Art of Drawers, and Spike Albrecht, Director of Franchise Development. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. Yeah, my pleasure. So Art of Drawers, this is a brand that has caused, caught my attention because really of the simplicity of the business model, the low investment, the quick ramp up, and the quick cash flow that is possible in the model. But before we dive into Art of Drawers, Alan, you have founded and started many different businesses. You are the also the author of a book called Disruptable that was published by Forbes Books. And you, you just have immersed yourself into business and learning how to fine tune and grow businesses. And notably, one business that you had built called Shelf Genie, which was is a franchise, was sold to a company called Neighborly in 2020. So congratulations on that. That's quite the accomplishment. Thanks. Yeah. So Alan, do you mind just giving us a high level overview of, you know, your background and what led you to Art of Drawers today? Sure. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur. Um, I had 14 businesses before I got to high school. My first one was when I was five. So um, it's definitely in my blood. Uh, I went to when I went to high school, my guidance counselor gave me and it might not have been bad advice at the time, but she's like, you can't go, you can't be an entrepreneur. You can't go start businesses right out of school, even right out of college. That's something you have to do after you've been in corporate America for 20 years. Um, and back then, you know, the late eighties entrepreneur was not a cool uh, thing to be called. That was your crazy uncle that lost all their money twice. Um, so I took her advice and I went to college, went in the army, um, as an officer for five years, um, got out um, and really started back into businesses. So mostly home improvement. Um, I did um, in-home um, theater, home automation type things, indoor air quality, heating and air company, um, really started building businesses. And then I got a note from the from the Army saying, you're still a reserve officer. So I got deployed in 2005. Um, and when I came back, there was a company that asked me to help them out and grow a dealer network um, called Shelf Conversions in Richmond. So I did that and I started opening my own locations as well in that model. So I opened up Chicago, Milwaukee, Twin Cities, Atlanta, Birmingham. And as I was doing that, I started my own call center. I started building my own software so I could scale it. And probably a couple of years into it, I realized that what I built was something that could be franchised. So all the systems and technology and processes to run five locations around the US that I didn't live in um, ended up being what the foundation of the franchise Shelf Genie was that we launched in the fall of 2008. And if you remember that time, um, that was a pretty pretty crazy and kind of similar time. We're you know, the beginning of the Great Recession but we're an Inc. 500 company the next three years. Um, we're an entrepreneur 500 company. Um, really, that that economy helped prove out that this model is, is extremely recession resistant. We do very well when the economy is going, going well, but we also do well in a recession because it's a small, affordable upgrade. So fewer people are gutting their kitchens. So we built that um, system in probably about two, 2016 with a couple hundred locations. It became really difficult to innovate. So I got frustrated because even a simple product to roll out to a system with a couple thousand people took, you know, six months, sometimes a year to get it fully adopted. So um, that's when the idea of Art of Drawers was born. And originally it was going to be a second brand for a Shelf Genie franchisees. So think about if you owned a Toyota dealership and Toyota comes out with Lexus and more elevator brand. Um, now you have two brands. Uh, but in 20, end of 2017, 2018, 
with some investors that we've had had for over a decade. So I had to go through a process to sell the company. So like you said, sold in neighborly in 2020. Um, and part of that, um, part of what was excluded from that sale was Art of Drawers and also the technology that we spent $5 million building that really runs the business. Um, I licensed that to neighborly. They got the the latest version of you know a couple of years ago, and now Art of Drawers is to continue to develop that software. And our, our franchisees also have the ability to license it to other companies, which is an exciting addition to our model, along with some other improvements we've made. Incredible background. I mean, what were your parents saying when you were in high school and had started already fourteen different business ventures? I remember what my dad said after the first one. Um, my first one was called the work club. So I found like my neighbor asked me to pull some weeds and he gave me $5. And I thought that was pretty amazing. So I started knocking on other neighbors doors and asking if they had any work. Um, and some of the jobs are bigger. So all the kids, and this is back when everyone was outside playing until it got dark. So we're always looking for things to do. So it's kind of like the Verizon guy I'd knock on a door and I had, 10 to 12 kids behind me, um, like, do you have any work for us to do? And they would give us jobs and get paid. And probably a couple months into it, I remember my dad came in my room and I had a stack of ones, fives, twenties, all this cash kind of laid out. I was organizing it. And he said, where, where did you get all that money from? And I told him what I was doing. And he said, well, how much are you paying the other kids to help you out? And I just remember looking at him and I, I got, I didn't know I should have been feel guilty about it, but I did when he asked me, I said, I didn't know I need to pay them anything. So, um, I took the, that was the best business I will ever have. Um, all revenue, no cost. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I was first exposed to, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My father and grandfather owned car dealerships, but my dad, when I was in middle school, decided to start a taco stand and the taco stand. So it's your food, typical food truck today, but we had a taco stand at the county fair. And he said all of the proceeds or all of the money we made was supposed to go out to our college fund. I just look back and I'm like, it was just free labor. That's all it was. <laughs> but It was a great <laughs> Great introduction to entrepreneurism for me. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so Art of Drawers, and you know, one thing you said, investing $5 million into the technology, I get asked so many times, you know, when by clients that I work with, well, and I'll use a painting company, for instance, I could go off and start my own painting company. Why would I invest in a franchise? Alan, you sharing the amount of money that was invested in the technology and the support that, you know, a franchisee would get when they invest in this already $5 million worth of technology and platform background. That's, that's phenomenal and definitely value added. So um, Spike, let's turn to you. What Let's take a dive into Art of Drawers. At a high level, what is it and why would this brand appeal to an investor? Yeah. Um, so Art of Drawers, we specialize in custom pull-out drawers in kitchens, pantries, bathrooms, essentially anywhere that you know you you have a cabinet or a drawer, we can come in and, and offer our services and our solutions. Um you know, kitchen organization, interior design, it is more popular than ever right now. Uh, Stacy, all the calls I've been on, I've, I've been taking intro calls for about a month now. And every candidate I've spoke with, um, they're familiar with it. They've, they've heard of it. They've seen it on, you know, Instagram, TikTok, social media, whatever it is. Everyone loves it. And when they see our services, I'll send videos of the work we do. Um, and what, you know, our, our services provide, people get excited about it. And, and I know Alan can speak to that. He always says that he can't believe, you know, he's been doing it for 15 or 20 years, how excited people get, get about what we do. Um, but also, you know, that's more on the, the services side, just from an investment standpoint, 
Alan kind of spoke to this earlier, but the investment range is great. Um, it's a lower price point than some of our other brands at Repum. Um, it's it's high revenue, high margin. Um, it's a high ticket business. Um, our staffing model is great. It's it's no employees. It's 1099 commission only. Um, so you don't have to worry about hiring and firing people. Um, and then it cash flows quickly. So, you know, you're up and running within 30 to 60 days and cash flowing within three to six months. So for folks who are looking to exit corporate America and want to start bringing in income quickly and replacing that salary, this is a great opportunity. So Spike, are you looking for primarily owner operators that are dedicated full-time to this business? So yes, Stacy. So, and, and Alan can speak to this. It's, I would call it part-time owner operator. Um, because when people think of owner operator, they think that they're going out there and buying the business and and running the design appointments and doing the installations. That is not the case with Art of Drawers. We definitely want people to be involved in the business um, and really grow and scale this. But as an owner, you'll be running some design appointments, Stacy, just mostly so you learn the process and you know what we're, you know, what you're doing, you understand the services. But the goal is for you to go out and hire a team of, of designers and installers or 1099 commission, not technically hire. Um, but the goal is for them to step away from the business and, and run run the business rather than being in it and, and spending all that time doing design appointments. So you speak of um, all contractor model. So somebody coming from the corporate world, um, you know, let's just, I'll take myself, for instance, I came from an aviation aerospace background. Um, how do I need experience to, to be able to efficiently run this model? And, or what type of skill set do the contractors, the designers, and the installers need to have? Um, that I would per se hire in a contractor form. Alan, can you touch on that for me? Sure. Uh, as far as experience, you know, our industry is probably a $100 million industry, and that's mainly Shelf Genie and Art of Drawers. It's the only company because of the software that's been able to scale. Um, so no one comes from the industry. Um, no background is, is needed. Uh, from a sales perspective, we provide all the sales training, our sales process is very simple. So our designers that the franchisees bring on board typically come from interior designers, professional organizers, you know, stay-at-home moms who had a career because they can go into our scheduling system and say, this is when I'm available and we schedule appointments for them. Uh, we've got actors. Um, we've got an actor here in Atlanta who's fantastic. Um, and it's it's great for them because it's it's really that gig economy that people who have a business they want to um, supplement with additional work. Um, on the installer side, um, same thing. Handyman, anybody that's uh, good with the drill, we do the training for the installers. And the training um, is really more about how to use our systems effectively and efficiently because they just measure, we custom build it, and then they're, they're putting it into the cabinets, mainly just screwing them to the bottom of the sides of the cabinets. So it's not complex. Um, so really no experience needed. Um, to Spike's point, we're not looking for an operator that's going to go out and do everything. Uh, we specifically designed this model for someone who wants to focus on growth um, and scaling. And that was my experience uh, as an entrepreneur. Every business I started, um, I would focus on growth. You know, the day you start your business, you only have one problem and it's a sales problem. And as soon as you solve for that, you have an operations problem. As soon as you fix the operations problem, you have a sales problem. So that pendulum um, used to swing for me dramatically. So in this model, um, on the operation side, our installers are responsible for scheduling the measurements, doing the measurements, uploading uh, the measurements. Custom, We handle the ordering and the custom building. It's delivered to a warehouse where the installer inspects it and then installs it. The franchisee does not have, um, other than general oversight, anything to do in that. Um, so we really want franchisees to focus on growth, which is recruiting, training, and mentoring that design team. Um, that's really their focus. So team building um, is is critical. 
sales background is not, you know, we don't have a, a pushy sales process. We just go in and design a great solution and help the customer choose what they want to get. And that's the other great thing about, there's not too many home service um, companies or industries where you can go in, design the entire thing, and then they get part of it with the entire design in mind and get the rest of it later, or just get that part that they really like. You can't do that with a roof or a driveway or a pool or pretty much anything else. So our, our sales process is not salesy. So you don't have to have a sales background and neither do the designers. So Alan, when you, when a call comes in, you know, an inquiry, a client wants a quote, a designer goes on site. Can you talk me through what that process looks like and what type of, you know, technology that Art of Drawers offers to facilitate that process to be able to ultimately provide a quote? Yeah, so it really begins with the lead generation. So we're doing the media buying, um, all the print and digital advertising for the franchisees. They can choose how much and where they want to spend the money. We present them with a budget. Um, They're also doing local event marketing. So home shows and local events, they have designers who go out and do the, the smaller local events. But once the leads are generated and that, you know, say, for instance, if there's a print ad, when the phone rings, there's a unique phone number that we can track the marketing source from. Same thing with all of our, all of our marketing. We know where that lead source came from. So our technology will put out um, for every marketing campaign, for whatever time frame you want to analyze it, the cost per lead, cost per appointment, revenue per appointment, and ultimately ROI on each marketing channel. So essentially we can work with the franchisee to turn up the volume on things that work well and turn it down or turn it off on things that don't. So our call center, um, our sales support center will take the calls, schedule the appointments, they'll make outbound calls. If you've ever worked um, home shows or, or big shows, when you finish up, you have all these leads to follow up on. And that's the last thing you typically want to do on a Monday morning after working all weekend. Uh, but that's exactly what our sales support center does is they start calling the candidates. Our, our um, software for the sales support center, we're calling every lead four times a week, different times of the day, then three times the next week, two times we send texts, we do emails. We're really reaching out to them until we find them. You know, we've had sales where we've contacted leads for, you know, up to 50 times over two or three years. So that's really um, the focus of our sales support center. And then when the appointment is scheduled, the designer gets an automatic notification, their calendar's updated. Uh, they go on the design, which is really, um, they introduce themselves to the client right after the, the um, appointment is scheduled. So the, the client's looking forward to having that person come out versus who's the strange person coming out and they show up already knowing them and having that rapport. Uh, but it's really, a, you know, we talk a little bit about our company and our different options. We have over 10 different types of wood types, different rail types, kind of give an overview of what we do. And then they spend, you know, 45 minutes to an hour going through their cabinets, not only adding custom pull-out drawers, but we're usually able to get 50% more usable storage space in cabinets and double it in a pantry. So you end up with all this extra space so we can go in and design your kitchen to flow better. So where you prep your food, where you cook your food, where you store your food, um, all those different areas are put into one place. So you're not doing this back and forth dance in your kitchen. Um, it's a much more elegant dance. So we design for them. And then they're really choosing the areas they want or the entire project we quoted. And our software has offline capabilities for the sales form. So you don't need the internet in the home. We found that to be problematic, even with hotspots, and you don't want to be asking the customer for their Wi-Fi. So that synchronizes with our with our um, software when they get back to internet, and then the sales are uploaded. The franchisee gets a notification, and they're really just approving sales and looking at commission rates. We have a commission module that um, will um, automatically run commission reports. The so payroll takes literally under two or three minutes to run for the different both installers and the designers. Um, and we have net promoter scores that are automatically sent out. They have a dashboard for that. They have a financial dash that shows not only their, their numbers, but all the franchises in the system and also all the designers, installers, and their numbers as well. Wow. Incredible. So this is a, from what I understand, this is a home-based business model, some 
small warehouse space would be needed for receipt of the product and the inspection prior to installation. So franchisees are not carrying inventory per se. Everything is custom ordered and delivered for a specific client. Yeah, other than initial rail inventory that they get as part of buying the franchise, it's a small number of rails that we continue to replenish based on their orders. But yeah, they're not required to sign long-term leases. It's typically flex warehouse space where they're not on a, they can make it bigger and smaller because it's shared uh, warehouse space. And the other part is they're not involved in that process. So when they assign an installer after they approve a sale, the installer does the intro call, um, the schedules a measurement appointment there. Uh, and, and our call center does a welcome call after the sale. So we welcome the Artitores family. We're making a lot of really high touch points, but the installer schedules the measurement, uploads the measurements. Our, our team will manage the ordering and the delivery. The installer schedules the install after the inspect. So the franchisees not involved in that process, they can see on the dashboard um, the 14 steps our customers go through and it's a stoplight dashboard so they can tell if anything's falling behind. But for the most part, most jobs are automated. Um, the installer gets paid after the customer's installed and final payments received. So typically we don't have any receivable issues. Um, we're not chasing down customers for money and the installer handles all of that along with our software and ordering team. And we mentioned previously um, quick cash flow. So how does the payment breakdown work? Um, at the time a client commits to an order, is there a certain down payment that is made and then a final at the end? Yep. So um, there's a 50% deposit. Um, so on that side of the equation, when you're getting the deposit, it's really paying or repaying yourself for the advertising investment. Um, our goal is to keep marketing in the 20 to 25% range, um, and that's based on revenue per appointment, how well we're selling, and, and the um, the cost per appointment. Uh, but that's typically covered in the 50% deposit plus the designer's commission. We pay the designers right after they sell full, so um, they're not waiting around for payments. There's nothing. As, as a salesperson, uh, we want our salespeople paid quickly and invigorated to go out and sell more. Um, and then when it's installed, um, that's typically when they're paying the cost of goods, which is 28% is our item 19 is cost of goods of total revenue and they pay their installer. So it cash flows on both the deposit and the final payment. That is fantastic. All right. So Spike, let's break down the staffing just a little bit more. We've spoke about designers, we've talked about installers, um, you know, in a single territory, when you're trying to get a territory, and let's, let's say one, two or three territories, how many designers and installers are truly needed when we look at having, say, a mature, a mature business? Yeah. Um, well, so just first off, um, when you look at the item seven, Stacey, like this is definitely a multiple unit play um, when you start looking at at the investment range. Um, but for one territory, we say for designers, it's about three to five um, designers per territory and then two to three installers per territory. Um, and then we also have territory marketing agents. You know, that's an optional role, but those are folks who are going out to those those home shows, boat shows that Alan was mentioning earlier. Um, so when you're fully ramped with two or three territories and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, you're just doubling or tripling that looking, you know, six to nine designers, um, you know, four to five installers. And, um, there's a lot of crossover here as well. So like designers can serve as your territory marketing agents. Um, but really the goal is to just constantly be building Stacy. You want to have as many designers as possible, you know, so that way as your, your, your appointment volume you know, continues to increase, um, you you have folks to send out in the field and, and, and run these appointments for you. And Alan, I know that your corporate location, so this brand um, was founded in 2019. I mean, you had the idea prior to that. 
but officially founded in 2019, started franchising just this year in 2023. You have two corporate locations, one in Atlanta and one in Tampa. Um, what do those locations look like today um, from a staffing standpoint? Yeah, so typically, um, I think we're at seven designers in Atlanta. Um, Tampa, we really opened up a little bit over a year ago um, just because I wanted our team to go through the paces of supporting a location that wasn't in our area. So Tampa actually is being, it's on the market to be you know sold as a franchise as well in that Tampa, St. Pete, um, Sarasota area. There's a lot of different territories there, but in Atlanta, we have you know seven eight designers, I think, uh, and it it fluctuates. And our designers, um, you know, Spike gave the average number, um, but it really depends upon the flex, the availability and flexibility of the designers you get. So we have a couple designers that will go throughout all of Atlanta. They'll drive outside of the area if we get leads that are an hour and a half, two hour drive away. They they cover a lot. We have other designers that want to stay more local to where they live. Um, and some of them have wide open schedules and some of them have uh, um, l- limited time that we're booking booking them. But Spike made the point, which is very true. You, you really never stop recruiting designers because they're commission only. Um, you never have to fire a designer, which I think most people really and same thing with installers. Um, letting people go is probably one of the more, more difficult and challenging and um and least desirable things you do when you own a business or you're managing a team. And you never have to um, fire designers, installers. You just stop assigning them appointments um, or jobs to do. But we also like to bring in designers that have a network where they can self-generate. So that's where kind of the, the, the trick question, and I'll give you the, everybody can hear the answer, but the trick question is, you know, like if you have three territories, what's the largest what's the amount of maximum number of designers that you would want to have and if you're bringing designers in which we do and say we're you can run some of our appointments but we want you to self-generate appointments and by the way you get you get more than double commission if you generated the appointment because we didn't have any marketing cost getting designers who aren't promised appointments we're not promising to feed their family and we give appointments to the top performing ones you can get as many as you need to get. So it's always recruiting because if you bring one in that's got better sales numbers than uh, the bottom person on on your team, they're going to get more appointments and you continue to build your team that way. But there's there's a number of factors that go into it. But I think the, the key is you never have to fire. You onboard, train, and then you're giving the company um, marketing paid appointments to the top performing ones. I like that. That is, thank you for highlighting that. That is an excellent point. And, you know, a, a client I spoke to recently is uh, just in the past couple of weeks, uh, you know, really concerned about that. They've, it's their first business investment. They're concerned with the hiring and firing of employees. They want a light uh, employee per se model. And, you know, the points you made about how this business is is structured with the incentivized commissions and not having to ever fire an individual is there's a lot of that's very attractive to many individuals. Yeah. And most people are really most leaders um, are really bad at firing, Um, you know, the adage of um, Hire slow, fire fast. Most people hire fast and fire slow. Um, And it's just a challenge. I I coach some CEOs and even CEOs of $100, $200 million companies are really bad. They just put it off because you know when you let that person go, you've got to deal with the aftermath. You've got to go hire somebody else. And it's easy just to kind of take a B or C player and let them them keep going. And um, it's funny, though. I always tell people in the history of hiring, no one has ever fired somebody and, and wished that they had waited longer. It's never happened. Um, but we wait longer most of the time. But in this case, you don't have to wait. You don't have to make that tough decision and put it off. They just don't get appointments. And, you know, what we, if if someone's not doing well, they if they self-generate, that, that's great. You know, we'll take one self-generated sale a month, a year, 
Um, it's just who do we give our appointments to that we're paying a lot of money to get in that home. Absolutely. All right. So Spike, we've spoke about that this is really a multiple unit play given the lower investment level, but we've kept everybody we we've not shared what the investment level is yet. So yep. best uh, kept secret. <laughs> yeah, best kept secret. So a single unit <clears throat> is between 115,000 and 160,000 in three units would be a total investment between 193 and 235. So given that and financial requirements, what we're looking for is a net worth of 300,000 liquid capital of 150,000. Mm -hmm. So given that, um, I know there's only a little bit, we're limited on what we can share from an ROI standpoint, but I do believe that you can share with us the average sale, um, yeah. Um, I, item 19 financial performance um, numbers just at a very high level. So what would those look like for a multiple territory play? Yeah, for sure. So um, the, number, the numbers in our item 19 are from the corporate location in Atlanta, three territories. Um, and based on last year's numbers, that did a little over a million dollars in revenue um, for top line. Um, the average sale or the average ticket is a little over five thousand. I think it's actually five thousand twenty six dollars to be exact. Um, conversion rate is forty seven percent. Alan mentioned those those cost of goods, which is around twenty eight percent. One of the things that I found over the years, we had a lot of corporate markets with Shelf Genie, and our, our our corporate markets are not as efficient typically and historically with the Shelf Genie model, which is very similar with some upgrades, but we don't run a corporate market efficiently because we don't have that owner. And that's why we're franchising that owner who wakes up every day, day thinking about the business, constantly recruiting, training, mentoring designers. Um, so they can, they should do, um, you know, our, our corporate markets perform okay, but it'll be a lot of fun to see franchisees come in who own that business. The other thing we've changed um, in this, in this model is we've got a software as a service model. So our franchisees can go out um, and license our software to closet companies, countertop companies, refacers, uh, cabinet makers. They can license this software, which the reason our industry hasn't grown and scaled like the closet industry is because you have to have this software to scale it. Um, so it gives us a really unique opportunity. That our industry is probably $100 million a year. The closet industry is $60 billion. And that's because you don't have to have complex software. Um, in fact, a lot of closet companies don't even have a, a, a CRM. They're just drawing it out, giving quotes, putting it in. Um, you can do it without the software, but you cannot do what we do. And closet companies would love to do what we do. They try to do it, but the complexities with infinite SKUs and custom down the millimeter wood with depth height, um, Quoting it, pricing it, managing it is what our software does. They get um, a royalty from anybody that's using the software in their territory um, on their top line sales. Um, and we also added refacing um, and cabinet lighting to our options. So that's new this year. So our item 19 from last year does not reflect that in our average sale. But as you can probably imagine, and you can look up um, cabinet reface, refacing average jobs, but it's it's higher than our average sale. And it's something that we don't typically have to pay. Um, we get a lot of upsells from it. So customers that are upgrading their cabinets typically are looking a lot of them to reface their cabinets. Absolutely. Wow. That's exciting news. I wasn't even aware of that. So multiple revenue streams, uh, minimal overhead, low investment, high revenue, uh, call center support, technology, no employees, all contractor model, and between a 60 and 90 day fast track ramp up really sums it up for Art of Drawers and not to mention a lot of white space for new franchise owners throughout the United States. Okay, so we're wrapping up, but before we go, I want to take a step back 
to your book, Disruptable, Alan. So what would you say? And I, I love reading. I love writing. I have always wanted to write a book. So this fascinates me. Um, so what would you say the top three takeaways would be from the book Disruptable for our listeners? Yeah, you know, first it teaches you to think differently, um, almost counterintuitively. I, I think from a very early age, probably kindergarten, first grade, we're we're taught to not fail um, and look at look at things from a, a binary. Um, I did well in this, or I failed. Not messing up. Uh, we get penalized in school for doing that, um, and we get penalized in in our corporate jobs for doing that. Um, but really, one of the things we value in, in Art of Drawers from, from a cultural standpoint is let's fail, but fail quickly and learn from it. That's what we, we celebrate success. Um, we actually question success more than we do failure because failure is where we learn, but we want to do it rapidly. That's what we've done in the last four years. That's how we innovate. Um, and I think getting um, comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, franchising is is very uncomfortable for most people. I typically, you know, I tell people that the day you buy the franchise and you're awarded a franchise and you buy it um, is the happiest you will ever be owning that business. Um, it's the happiest you'll ever be when you start a business. Um, and then it drops like the first month or two, you're like, everybody's like, what am I doing? This is scary. Um, and then and then you build up from there, but getting, getting comfortable um, being uncomfortable and following the system you know, and and then really just not being fear driven, um, understanding fear is a part of the process. But you know, if you're comfortable um, embracing failure and failing fast, um, and getting out of your comfort zone, um, and and following the system, those are the things that work well in life, and they also work really well in franchise. I love it. That is that is great advice. And I would say, I mean, just from my experience as a business owner as well having built a business from the ground up and now having invested in a franchise myself, um, you know, there, there definitely is that fear, then elation, then fear, and it's a roller coaster. but I have learned the best lessons from the failures that I've had. And, you know, that, and I like where you say that you question success more than failures. That's pretty profound. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining me today to share more about the art of drawers. Um, for anybody that has listened this far, thank you. And for the first 10 people to respond and comment to this podcast, I will send you one of Alan's books, Disruptable at No Charge and Touch Base with You. So you can learn more about Alan's experience and lessons learned in his entrepreneurial journey. For anybody interested in learning more about the art of drawers, please feel free to reach out to me at Stacy at fusionfranchising.com. Thank you and have a great day. The reason why we call it Art of Drawers is that it is getting more and more difficult to get things from the bottom drawer because we have to go down on our knees to reach for the items at the back of the cabinet drawers. And this made things a lot easier. My installer was great. He was very professional. He actually had to do a little bit of modification to the drawer to accommodate the pipes at the back wall. And that was really good. The best part of my job with Art of Drawers is to really give a customer a transformed space. Um, more specifically, the, the older generation, when you know they, they get into a space, they just can't do as much as they could anymore. But with the accessibility of the drawers and the better functionality with the current cabinets, just they're like, oh wow, I can I can do this again. I can reach for that plate, and it's the smallest things, but it really makes a big difference for them. Best story I've had is just you know someone was unsure. They were excited about what they saw at a home show. When I got done, it was probably my 12th or 13th install, but I, it was a large job. But I was able to get it done in one day just through process. And they were like, well, I didn't think you would be that fast. And then they opened up the, the, their divider their shelves and saw how organized it was, their pantry. They could reach everything now. They had all these new features. 
and I think they just they they were speechless. They were just like, I don't I don't know what to say, and they just hugged me, and it was just a fun just like. They hugged me, I think, two more times before I left, and they're like, thank you so much, you know? Like, I'm thank you for, you know, for the hugs. Training was very detailed, and that you experience a couple of practice training, basically. You go to your family and friends and go to their kitchen and start designing, and you have somebody that show you how it has to be done, and you have a chance to ask all of your questions. That helps you to just have that confidence when you actually go to the real appointment. Biggest design challenge was a retired nurse, Miss Susan. And when I went to her house, she just retired and she had three kids. She was a cook and a baker, and she had a lot of gadget in the kitchen. And when I walked in, I was like, how am I gonna design and fit everything and organize everything? So what we did, we designed everything and we categorized her kitchen after the installation was done. When I went there, I helped her to just categorize and put all the pots and pans. We tried to fit everything right. At the end, she was so thankful. I feel great about leading the training experience because I get to see not only the installs that I got to do succeed, but the installs of my installers, watch them start to become successful. And that's really what makes you feel like you're a part of something bigger than yourself. My best installation experience was with a customer here in Atlanta and she had Parkinson's. Uh, and the Parkinson's foundation actually paid for half of her design. The designer worked with her and really designed something that made the difference with her because on that install, when I installed it, it was the difference in between her husband having to bring home food for the past three or four years because she couldn't cook at home any longer to now having custom pull-out drawers in her kitchen and her appliances and everything that she needed was available to her. And it was very emotional when she got to call her husband because we finished the install early that day and told him that she was going to be cooking dinner that night. That was a very special moment. In one word, I would say amazing. Thank you.